This is a design that I've been working on, which I think would be quite interesting to look at together. It incorporates an STM32 microcontroller, an RF transceiver and antenna interface, as well as a USB full speed interface. The design generally requires a bit more attention due to the high speed signaling on the PCB and lets us explore a few more advanced circuit design and PCB layout topics. The overall idea of this board is that it can be used for many different projects. For example, take a robot that has RF capabilities and we need to log the data that this robot is picking up. One way of doing it is having an RF link. So the robot has an antenna and an RF transceiver and sends data over the air. And we pick it up on this PCB here, process it using this STM32 and send it out to a host computer for logging using the USB interface. Of course, there are many more different applications we could use this board for, but as a general idea, that's what I had in mind. Overall, I'm using popular and inexpensive parts. For example, STM32 microcontrollers, which are fairly inexpensive, and this NRF24 transceiver. So if I pull up the datasheet here, you've probably heard of it. It's an NRF24 L01, so a low power RF transceiver working at 2.4 gigahertz. And you can see it a lot in Arduino projects, but I thought it'd be quite nice to use it because it's inexpensive. Um, and then with an STM32. The STM32 microcontroller I chose was this STM32 L432KB. So this is part of their low power line. If you look at the ST website, it's an ultra low power microcontroller running at 80 megahertz. I chose this because first of all, it's low power. Uh, we don't need much processing power. Essentially, the STM32 just provides a link between the RF and the USB host computer. It, we don't need much flash, we don't need much RAM, but we do need a USB full speed interface. It's nice because this STM32 has the physical layer inside the chip already, so we don't have to do anything, any more complex design. Okay, so now we've gone over the RF transceiver and the STM32 microcontroller. I also thought instead of having a PCB antenna, it would be nice to have an SMA connector over here where we can attach various types of different passive 2.4 gigahertz antennas to this board. So we're not constricted to using just one antenna. Overall, I also wanted a relatively small form factor. So this looks big here, but this is actually 15 millimeters in height and about 40 millimeters in length. So very, very small. I also chose to do this because there's quite a lot of interesting aspects of circuit and PCB design. For instance, USB differential signaling and just RF layout and routing in general. Okay, so just, that's just gone over the overview of the board. Let's move on step by step how to actually design this board and what kind of design decisions I made. I usually start by choosing my microprocessor and what pinout I need. So what, what interfaces I need, if I need GPIOs, SPI, I squared C, and I tend to do that in QMX or QBID. So I will choose a microcontroller, which is an STM32 L432. I will, it'll show me this view here of which pins I can use and this overall size of the chip. For example, I can choose SPI3 and just select a full duplex mask and so forth, and then select all the pins. So that's the first step I do. At the end, I'll have some sort of pinout diagram like this, where I selected all the SPI pins and the extra GPOs which link up from the STM32 to the RF transceiver. I've selected the SWD debug interface, which will have pins out here. I've selected the USB, which will go to this USB connector here, as well as two LEDs, receive and transmit, just to indicate if we're receiving or transmitting packets. Okay, so once I've done that, I tend to move on to schematic creation, which we'll do in KiCad. All right, so if we go, I've made a little project here called STRF, go to the schematic layout editor, and here's the schematic I've come up with so far. I tend to section my schematics, so, I've seconded it into three parts here. We have the power and connector parts up here, USB connector. We have the transceiver part over here and the microcontroller part over here. Okay, I generally also put notes next to my schematic because then in, for future use, I'll know what, I, what, what the hell I was actually doing. Okay, but let's start with the power section of the board, which is over here. So USB has a five volt power connection to it but we need 3.3 volts to drive the processor and the transceiver. 
Now, in the data sheet for the STM32, it says that we actually need 3.3 volts pretty much exactly for the USB to work on the STM32. So that's one thing to take in mind. Because we're using USB to power this board, we need to be a bit more specific with what decoupling caps we use. So the USB specification says the input capacitor C1 needs to be a maximum of 10 microfarads. If it's any larger, the inrush current when this board is plugged in first to the host computer will be too large, and um, the host device might not like that. So a maximum of 10 microfarads at the input is given in the USB specification. Another thing to note is, usually I would put in reverse polarity protection in terms of a diode or a P-channel MOSFET. But since we're using um, a USB connector here, the chances of actually getting reverse polarity on the input voltage are very slim. So I thought I'd just omit it for the, for the sake of board space. But in general, it's quite a good idea just to put a reverse polarity protection on there. I put a fuse of 100 milliamps in, and that should be probably more than enough for the power consumptions or current consumption of this board. Other than that, it's a fixed LDO regulator which can drop 5 volts to 3.3 volts fairly efficiently. And that'll give us maximum 200 milliamps at 3.3 volts. Okay, so that's kind of the very, very basic 3.3 uh, re regulator. Another thing maybe to note is that I'm using a ferro bead just to limit the high frequency interference coming from the power supply. So essentially, it's almost effectively an inductor. So at, really, at high frequencies, at 100 megahertz, it looks like a 100 ohm impedance. Okay, so moving on, the next section I would like to look at is this STM32 section. And again, this is taking just information from the data sheet and application notes provided by ST and making a schematic out of it. So it's fairly simple. Um, the pinout is transferred from Cubamex. So I showed the, the picture of that pinout. So I've just labeled all the pins using these global labels over here and put them on. Other than that, I use one decoupling capacitor of 100 nanofarads per VDD pin. So we've got one, two, three here. That's why I have three 100 nanofarad capacitors up here. I also tend to put one bulk decoupling capacitor fairly close to the general chip itself. So in this case, it's a one microfarad capacitor. All right, um, we also have this boot zero pin over here, which is pH three in this case, and I pull this low. So the boot pin determin determines if the bootloader is started or not. In my case, I will be programming via SWD and not using UART or USB to program this ST, so I can pull the boot pin low. Uh, there are several application notes and in the data sheet it'll tell you what boot pins you need to pull high or low to achieve which bootloader setting. But in general, if you want to use USB or UART to program it, pull this high or make it variable with a dip switch. But if you're just going to be using SWD, pull this pin low, the boot zero pin low with a 10K resistor. Okay, so next I've got these two LEDs. Um, I've chosen green, yellow, any color should be fine. And then of course, current, current limiting resistor. The way you can calculate the current limiting resistor is you have 3.3 volts at uh, the GPO pin when it is high. A uh, red or um, yellow LED will drop about 1.8 volts, and then you do 3.3 minus 1.8 divided by your current requirements, maybe 2 milliamps, and that will give you the, the resistor values. So I think I calculated about 1 milliamp for each um, LED, and that's usually more than enough. That's fairly bright. Okay. Um, also for USB, it's it's a bit hard to find in the data sheet, but once you know it, you, you won't forget, is that the USB differential pair inputs... Here, USB D minus and USB D plus don't need any external termination or pull-up resistors. These normally there you'll see these 22 ohm resistors in series with the D minus and D plus lines. But for this US uh, for this STM32, you won't need that. They incorporate it into the chip, which is really nice. And I've made a little note down here as well. Also, to indicate that it's a full-speed device, you'll sometimes need a D plus uh, pull-up pin, a pull-up resistor of about 1.5 kilo ohms. But that's incorporated into the device as well. And that's given in the application node AN4879. So it's a bit daunting at first to see what external resistors you need, what termination resistors you need. But um, once you have it once, this is usually fairly the same for most ST microcontrollers. Okay, other than that, I've uh, this is that section pretty much done. Here I have the serial wire debug connector. And if you just Google 
arm 10 pin SWD, you can see what the pinout is for a typical um, SWD connector. So if you just copy that over, transfer it to your schematic, that's exactly what I've done. And that'll fit with the ST link adapter. Okay, um, this is something that, that isn't strictly necessary is this um, essentially debouncing capacitor on the end reset pin, 100 nanofarads, and that just essentially helps to prevent parasitic resets. So if, you, if someone touches the pin with a hand, it might reset the device. That kind of protects it against that. Okay, so that was already the microcontroller side. Let's move over to the USB connector. So remember here on the microcontroller, we have the USB differential pair, minus D minus and D plus, and that goes to the USB connector here. And I've chosen a USB microconnector just for the size. Um, just before that though, I've chosen this USB LC6 to SC6, and that is to prevent against ESD. So we'll have a lot of human touch when plugging and unplugging the USB cable to the connector. And humans can carry quite a lot of static voltage on them, which might dis discharge through the PS uh, PCB, and that's what we definitely don't want. And this chip is an ESD projection chip, fairly common, that'll protect that. So it has loads of TVS diodes inside and a nice little um, six, six pin package. Uh, but I'll show you more of that when we actually get to the PSB layout and uh, uh, PCB layout and routing. I can just go sneak peek. It's this chip here. So we're routing from the STM32 through to that chip and then through to the through to the connector. But more on that later. Okay, so back to the USB connector. The USB connector has strictly defined uh, pinouts. So pin one is the five volts, which then goes through the fuse through the ferrode bead to the regulator. We have our data lines, data plus and data minus. And we also have this ID pin, which we don't need. So I just use a no connect flag. Ground, of course, is connected to ground. And the shield is an interesting aspect. So shield, um, the opinions vary, but according to the USB specification, the question is, do we need to ground this shield or not ground the shield? And the answer is the shield is grounded at the host side. So if you're connecting this to a, a a PC, this will be grounded at the host side. Now we don't want any current to flow through the shield um, because we don't want any current or to flow from, for example, the host to the PCB and then to therefore induce noise into the PCB. And we also want it to act as a shield. So we do not ground the shield on the PCB side. So again, add a no connect symbol here. For more information on that, there's plenty of information online. Uh, just Google shield, USB ground or not grounding. Okay, so the last thing we need to look at is the transceiver side, so which is this whole section over here. A good thing here is to always follow the data sheet. So if we look at the data sheet again, um, which is over here, this will have a lot of information of just the general block diagram, the pinouts, but it'll also, if, we, if I can find it, give you an ex application example. So if we're using a single-ended um, matching network, so we have a single-ended antenna, it'll tell you about the crystal you need to use and what frequency that needs to be at, various decoupling capacitors and pull-up and pull-down resistors, and so forth. And essentially all you need to do is transfer this schematic to KiCad, and that's pretty much exactly what I've done. I've seconded, sectioned it a bit more, and we'll go through it. But essentially, follow the data sheet, and if that application example matches what you need, in this case it does, because I'm using just a single-ended in antenna of 50 ohms, you can just transfer it over. And they'll give you the component values you need for the matching networks and so forth. But let's just go through it quickly. So here we have the NRF chip. We've got all the connections to and from the microcontroller. We have various pull-up resistors, and of course, again, the decoupling capacitors. So again, per VDD, we will use one decoupling capacitor and one bulk decoupling capacitor, which will be close to the chip. So the NIF transceiver we're using here also requires an external crystal. And the schematic for that is given in the data sheet over here. So I've pretty much exactly taken over and put it into KiCad. Um, now, the one thing you might have to change, depending on the crystal you're using, is the load capacitors on either side of it. 
Um, so the crystal I'm using here, I calculated the load capacitors to be 12 picofarads on either on each side. And the way you can ca calculate it is, is that on the datasheet for the crystal, you'll use you find a load capacitance. You take this load capacitance, you subtract the the stray capacitance you'll expect on your PCB. So this will be anything from two to five picofarads, and you multiply that value by two. So I did that for this crystal here, and these are the values I got. Um, for more for more detail, just Google um, crystal load capacitance or PS crystal oscillator, and it'll it'll tell you exactly why these uh, capacitors are there. Okay, so the final thing we need to look at for this transceiver is the antenna impedance matching and the SMA connector. So if we go back to this, the 3D view, we've done the crystal here, we've done this STM32 microcontroller, and we've done this USB part over here. So the, crisp, uh, the RF matching part, the antenna matching part, is all this stuff over here. So we need to do that because this chip will have a certain output impedance, I don't know, it could be a kilo ohm or something, or 200 ohms. But our antennas generally have an impedance of 50 ohms. And we somehow need to match this one kilo ohm, or 200 ohms, whatever, to 50 ohms. And this is what this matching network does. So it converts essentially an impedance here to an impedance here and makes sure both sides see a matched load. And this is very important because the signal voltages and signal powers we're seeing or receiving from the RF side are incredibly small and we want to minimize any reflections and power losses. So therefore, we can actually transfer the maximum signal strength. And this is what this network does. Additionally, in, uh, also, in, uh, oh, it converts impedances, but it also converts from single-ended antenna to a differ differential input from this chip. So we have a differential connection here, but we have a single-ended antenna over here. And this network also converts single-ended to differential. But again, this is given in the datasheet. So essentially it's this network I have transferred over here, which is quite nice because you don't have to do any of the complex calculations yourself. Okay, so this pretty much concludes the schematic section. And next we'll move on to component selection and then layout and routing. Okay, so now we're ready to select our components. I've clicked up here on assign PCB footprints to schematic symbols. And this has opened this window where we can actually assign footprints to every component in the view. So in general, because I'm, I want to make a rather small PCB, I've gone for 0402 components, so rather small SMD components. Especially for the RF side of things, it's actually quite important that they are 0402 components. And that is also given or mentioned in the datasheet for the NRF24. Uh, so all these components you see here are 0402. Other than that, um, the only places where I've used 0603, so slightly larger surface mount components, is, for example, the bulk uh, capacitors, so the larger capacitors, so 10 microfarads are all 0603s, and also the resistors for the LEDs, the current limiting resistors. So anything which has to handle higher currents or higher needs to dissipate more power, I generally tend to make them larger. Other than that, um, I've also made the fuse fairly large, so that's actually 1206 in size, so over here, that's 1206. Um, just so, in case it, it burns out and needs to be replaced, it's easy to replace. Um, other than that, I've chosen a USB connector, which is fairly cheap, and an SMA connector, um, which is a 50 ohm connector rated at 2.4 gigahertz. So I can show you that looks something like this. This is just a fairly random 3D model, but the general view is here. And it's, and it's an edge mount PCB connector. So it'll slide onto the edge like this, and we can solder it down onto the pads. Okay, so that pretty much is the component connection. And so let's move on to layout. Okay, so now we're in the PCB editor, and let's just talk about layout to start with. A good idea is to always do a rough sectioning of what components need to go where. So let's look at the 3D view. So we have th essentially three, four different main sections. We have the USB and power section, we have the STM32 section, and we have the RF section. So three to four different sections, and first of all you want to do the rough layout. So roughly take the components, put them in positions where you think they'll be later on, 
But don't be too finicky. So don't change the grid size very small and try to mess around and move these millimeters or less than millimeters. You want to kind of just do a rough placement to get a feel for how big the board is actually going to turn out to be. So we want to determine the board size via the rough placement and try to fit all our components into that space. We also want to make sure that we're placing, if we can, all the components just on one side. As you'll see here, all my components are on one side. This makes the assembly much cheaper, makes the troubleshooting much cheaper. You don't always have to flip the board up and down and you can actually place this on a flat surface. Okay, we also want to place the critical components first. So this could be, for example, your centerpiece and your RF sections. You want to place the chips first, your RF layout first, the crystals first, and things like decoupling capacitors over here. So decoupling capacitors want to be really or very close to the supply pins. So for example, here we have the supply pins, 3.3 volts, and our decoupling capacitors are only fractions of a millimeter away from these pins. So place critical components first and then place less critical components. For example, less critical components could be this 3.3 volt regulator, right? And there's no high speed signals going through this or near this or this fuse. These are not entirely critical if you place them a bit off. So critical components first and then the less critical ones and try to fit them in the board space. We also want this um, ESD protection chip, which is this one here, close to the USB connector. So closer to the USB connector than to the STM32 chip. Um, regarding the RF layout, luckily, if we look at the data sheet, there is actually a PCB layout example given. This will give you where you need to put all the RF matching, the ICs, various connectors and crystals. It'll tell you where to put them. And this is exactly what I've done here. I've transferred the example they give, gave onto this PCB. And that should mean it should hopefully work and be a good layout. Okay, and generally um, manufacturers will give this kind of information in their data sheets. Okay, so once you've done the rough layout, you've placed all the parts, you can determine the board outline. So I, I initially placed all the parts fairly roughly and said, okay, this should fit in, this, in these kind of dimensions. So I ended up being 15 millimeters high and 39 millimeters wide. I also added, using the edge cuts layer, these rounded corners. I tend to think, uh, this is using this add graphic arc tool, I tend to think it makes the PCBs look a bit, a bit nicer. Okay, so now you've got the rough uh, layout, you've done the edge cuts layer, you've got the dimensions sorted, now you can actually go into the fine tuning of the layout. So making sure decoupling capacitors again are close but maybe they're not optimally close so you can optimize things and actually go to the, go into a finer grid setting and move them around a bit more finely so fine tune that for as long as you have to because a good layout ensures that you'll have a much easier time actually routing this board okay so i was i was fairly happy with my layout here and it turned out that made my pcb routing task much easier and that's what we're going to move on to now Okay, so now let's get started with routing. But before we can start with routing, we need to look at the layer stack up. So in general, anything RF, you want at least four layers. So two layer boards will mean your controlled impedance traces will be very, very wide. And you'll generally have problems with decoupling and power planes and so forth. So what I tend to do is generally stick with a four layer board and you'll be pretty safe. So if you go up here into the board setup, you can see the layer stack up. So the top, we have the front copper, we have an inner copper, secondary inner copper, and the bottom copper layer. Now I will be using the front copper just for signals. The inner copper layer will be ground. The second inner copper layer will be power, or 3.3 volts, and the lower copper layer will be signal. PCB signals is 1.6, is and that all looks fine. Okay, we all, what we want to do is then route section by section. So we've laid it out nicely. Now we want to route, for example, all the USB. We want to route all the power in one section. We want to route all the STM in the one section. And we want to route all the RF in, into one section. In general, we want to keep the largest tracks we can and larger tracks for higher current traces. And the same goes for VIAs or VIAs. You want anything that carries any higher current to be as thick as you can possibly make it. For example, here, these power tr tracks over here are almost a millimeter w wide, and um, any signal traces, for example, up here, 
or anything coming out of these small pads will be, I don't know, 0.3 millimeters wide. We also want to keep high speed signals from different systems away from each other. So for example, here are the SPI lines, you want to keep that away from the USB or serial wire debug lines. So any high speed signals which aren't part of the same system, we want to keep separate. Also, every ground or power pad, for example here, ground, should have its own via. So we have one ground via going here, one ground via go here, and so forth. And that's general, generally a good rule. Of course, sometimes you'll have situations where you won't have, have enough space, but generally one via per pad, for power or ground pad. The nice thing using a four-layer um, four PCB is we have these copper pores in the middle, and we can just use a via to connect directly to this copper pole. And this gives a nice uh, low inductance connection to ground or power. Okay, um, so on the topic of ground pores, if I switch to this view so we can actually see them better, you'll see at the front layer, I have some ground pores, but they're mainly just used so I don't have to route everything manually. The inner first inner copper layer, as we said, is a ground pole, and this is a huge uninterrupted ground pore, except for this crystal here, but we'll get into that a bit later. The second inner layer, we have this large 3.3 uh, volt ground pore, but nothing underneath the RF section, and we'll get into that later as well. And finally, the lower or the back copper layer, again, a large ground pore, but nothing underneath this RF section and nothing underneath the crystal. All right, but let's, let's just start with looking at the power section. So again, we want large tracks between, this is, this is the, the, the regulator over here. So we want large tracks. And we also want, because this regulator is gonna feed essentially the power into one of these ground planes, you want a lot of parallel vias connecting into that power plane and also into that ground plane. So a lot of parallel vias means we reduce the inductance. Okay, so that was already the very simple power circuit over here. That's what you need to pay attention to, large tracks and parallel vias to reduce the inductance into feeding into the ground and power planes. So over here, this is our STM32 chip and essentially our centerpiece of this board. And that's why I thought it'd be quite nice just to put this uh, into the center of the board. Um, so as I said before, we want the decoupling capacitors first, close to the supply pins. And then I routed the SPI connections to this NRF chip. And also, for example, the serial wire de debug to this connector and lesser important connections, such as these LED connections. So this, you see the kind of order I did things. First I'll do decoupling capacitors, then any high speed traces, for example, SPI and USB and serial wire debug, and then the less important ones. Uh, we'll get into USB in just a second. But before that, let's have a look at the NRF chip. Again, as I said before, the layout is in the datasheet. All right, you can just copy that over. Again, decoupling capacitors close to the supply pins and so forth. Uh, one important thing here is, of course, that we're using a crystal. Uh, or rather, the NRF requires a crystal for proper operation. Um, what you need to pay attention to here is that nothing... No high speed or any signals in general should be running near or below the tracks of the crystal. So you see I have no traces running underneath the crystal, no high speed traces, everything is nicely separated. Another thing you need to pay attention to is that the ground pore is separated for the crystal. So if I switch to this view, you see that I have a huge ground plane for the rest of the board, but the crystal is separated. So I have drawn a little um, ground pore underneath it and connected it to the main ground pore with a very thin trace only at one point. And there's several sources which recommend doing it this way and it's uh, worked well for me so far. But this is one thing you really should pay attention to. So I have no other tracks or any other ground pores underneath this, just the one on the inner plane and it's connected by this one trace onto this uh, larger ground pore. Okay, so now we're coming to the more interesting parts of the board, and we're going to look at the USB and RF sections. So one thing to mention right at the start is that impedance matching is very important now. 
In general, for RF, uh, we want a 50 ohm impedance traces. So for example here, all these traces are matched to 50 ohms. So let's look at that first. So you can see here the width is 0 0.293 millimeters, and I'll tell you exactly how I got to that answer. So if we go to my preferred PCB manufacturer's GLC PCB, uh, let's just click on quote now, choose a four layer board, and then it will show up with this impedance calculator. And this is what I use because you'll need to know the stack up from your manufacturer of the PCB. Uh, so I can see if this works. So every PCB manufacturer will give you this kind of information of how their PCBs are layered up. So if there's a copper layer and then there's going to be a dielectric material or another copper layer and so forth. Uh, the, what the PCB manufacturer I use is this, and this is the stack up for their board. And their stack up will d determine the width of the trace for a certain impedance. Luckily, they will usually also include an impedance calculator. So I will choose, I want impedance and trace space. I want a 50 ohm impedance trace. I'm routing it on an outer layer and it's a single ended on a four layer board. So I click essentially calculate. And for the stacker I'm using, which is this one here, the recommended trace width is 11.55 mil for, for, to give a 50 ohm line. And all you have to do is then go to board setup, go to uh, where is it? tracks and vias, and I typed in 11.55 mil here, so I'll just type in 11.55 mil, press enter, and it'll then convert it to millimeters for you. And it turned out to be 0 0.29337 millimeters. And this is, will give you a 50 ohm track. And this is what I've used to route the whole RF section here. So this is 50 ohms, this is 50 ohms, and so forth, all the way into this chip here. Now what's also important is not just that your track widths are correctly, uh, set, and you can use an uh, um, impedance matching calculator to do that, but also that you have an uninterrupted ground plane directly underneath the layer where you're routing. And this is what I have here. So I have the top layer, which is this red, this red copper here, but underneath I have an uninterrupted ground plane. So anywhere there there's signal, there's no, there's no discontinu discontinuities in the ground plane, and that needs to be the case for everything. Another thing you need to take care of is that you don't have a ground fill next to the traces, the controlled impedance traces, because otherwise, if you have a ground fill, let's say next to this here, you'll also get kind of impedance matching or microstrip effects between these planes, and that's not what you want. You want only the effects to take place between the top layer and the next inner layer, which is a ground pull. And the same goes for any controlled impedance or high speed trace. So calculate the correct trace impedance, and then also put a solid ground pour underneath. And of course, you can figure out the stack up and what impedances and trace widths you need from various different calculators. There's also one in KiCad uh, up here. So PCB calculator, you can go to transmission line, type in your PCB parameters, and it'll, it'll calculate what trace width you need. Okay, but keep those uh, two things in mind, trace width and uninterrupted ground fill underneath and no ground fills next to it. Okay, uh, so let's check if I've covered everything for that. Okay. Um, and the same goes for the USB as well. So USB, you will see I have um, matched impedance traces and I'll tell you about differential impedance traces in a second. But you see that the ground fill is uninterrupted underneath all the way to the connector. Okay, so here we looked at single-ended matching. USB is a differential um, communication system or signaling system, and we need to do differential matching. But it's as easy as it was before. USB requires a 90 ohm differential impedance. We click on differential. Uh, we also need to click the trace space. So the separation between the tracks. So this separation here. And uh, you're free to choose any of these values here. These are in, mil in mils, and I, I chose 8 mils. And then you can click Calculate, and it gives you 10.28 mils trace width. So the trace width was this, 8 mils, and the trace width is, what was that, about 10 mils here. Uh, you can also enter that in the board setup. We type in the width, which was about 10 mils, I believe. The gap was 8 mils, and I just set the via gap to the same. 
and that this will then enable you to route differential pairs, which are controlled impedance. Um, okay. So the way you can route those is click on route and then differential pair, and then click on whatever you need to hear and it'll route it for you. Okay. Um, so one thing you might need to do with USB and with differential traces is to actually match the skew or the length of the tracks. Just clicking on root and then differential pair and routing the pairs does not guarantee that these, the length of the individual traces will be the same. And that can result in different, uh, that the signals arrive at different times at the receiver. And that can be quite dangerous. The maximum skew you can have, or maximum difference in reception times for USB is stated in the specifications and is given as 400 picoseconds, which is a fairly large margin for, for the speeds we're looking at here. But the way you can match the trace lengths is if you go to root, tune differential pair skew, click on one of these and then just drag around and you see it's trying to match the length of the trace. And that's what I've done here. So this little bump here is actually matching these two traces to be pretty much equal length. Okay, and these apparently are equal length as well. So everything skew-wise is looking fine as well. So just to recap, you want to calculate the correct trace width and trace separation to give you a proper impedance. You want to have an uninterrupted ground plane underneath. And you also want to make sure the skew or the phase difference between the two differential lines is uh, matched so you don't get any problems with reception on transmission. Okay, so that's uh, USB routing and, R and RF impedance matching routing rather quickly. Uh, one thing you'll notice here in the 3D view is this ring over here. So you see it starts essentially when this RF section starts and ends at the RF connector. And this is what is called a guard ring. And the guard ring typically surrounds critical RF circuitry, so low power signals coming from the antenna onto the BCB. So these are incredibly low power signals, and you want to shield them from any stray currents which may arise on the PCB. And you can use a guard ring to do so. So a guard ring will be essentially exposed copper around your RF circuitry, and it will be tied to a low impedance ground. That's why you have all these vias here to tie it to ground. Um, so an example where you might see that, you'll see that in loads of RF uh, systems, but here a great example is the Hack RF. And you see here you have an RF input, and all the RF section is shield by, shielded by this guard ring around it. And this is exactly what I'm doing here as well. So we have a copper, essentially pore, connected with loads of ground vias to the ground plane underneath. Okay, and that, in a, in a nutshell, is the RF routing. Um, yeah, again, uh, I'm probably sick of hearing it now, but uninterrupted ground plane, matched RF traces, impedance matched traces, and make sure the skew for differential pairs is um, matched. Yeah, and you, you should be pretty safe. And again, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. I also have a video on controlled impedance traces, which goes into a bit more detail of how how these calculations come into, into play for the calculating the correct trace widths. But yes, uh, just to reiterate the point that it's good to keep clearance between everything and especially high-speed traces. So you see I've left quite a bit of gap between any high-speed traces, for example, the RF, and any other high-speed traces, for example, the USB or the SPI on the, on the, on the board. So then you will try to, I know this is a very small board space, but try to maximize the clearance between um, high-speed traces. So you minimize capacitive cross-talk and cross-coupling. Okay, so we've, that pretty much concludes the routing part. So all the, all the important aspects have been highlighted. Um, maybe one thing just to mention here, you'll see I have some vias and pads. And it usually was shunned upon that you shouldn't be doing VAs and pads because it was difficulty in manufacturing and soldering. But generally, it, um, manufacturers these days can handle that perfectly. And it just enables, again, multiple VAs in this ground pad enable a thermal connection uh, for one. So you'll have better thermal dissipation because these VAs will then connect into this large ground plane for heat dissipation. In this 
scenario, it's not a problem because we're not going to be dissipating very much heat or power. Um, but it also enables these multiple wires enable a low impedance connection to ground as well. Okay, so once you've done the majority of the routing, the next thing, of course, is to make it look a bit prettier. And one way of doing that is adding silkscreen. So, for example, I've added just labeling to make sure everyone knows what these LEDs are for. So it's a reception and transmission LED. I've uh, marked that this is in a serial wire debug connector. I've put a little, essentially, logo or a little silkscreen image on to label what this product actually is. Put my website on the back, of course. Mark that this is pin one. Um, yeah, just to make sure people know what's going on with this board. Another thing for assembly, which is quite useful, is to mark the locations of pin one. So you see these little dots here, mark the location of the pin one of each um, IC. So pin one here, pin one here, and so forth. I've also marked the polarity of the diodes. So the anode is marked with positive here, and that just helps for assembly or for any troubleshooting. Um, okay, so that's the silk screen making it look uh, more a bit prettier than before. And the other thing you can do here is for this 3D model, not all parts will have a 3D model associated with them. So for the 3D model for this SMA connector, I actually had to Google um, uh, to try and find a, a step model so I can import this into KiCad. And the way you can usually do that is usually manufacturers will have 3D part uh, models in, in step formats or various different uh, 3D formats. You can just download that from the manufacturer's website or, of course, just Google the part name and 3D model or use sites like GrabCAD and stuff like that. Okay, so once you're happy and you've checked the design multiple times, you've checked the schematic, the layout and so forth, made sure everything looks nice, the ground pores look good, you've done the the, the DRC check and made sure there's no errors. It's time to export it for manufacturing. And uh, the way you do that is file, plot, uh, generate geo files, first of all, generate geo file, and then you want to uh, generate all the layer files, so the front copper, inner coppers, layer coppers, silk screen, and so forth. Just click plot, creates all the Gerbers, and then you can send that off to your PCB fab house for manufacturing. But uh, if you want assembly, you will also have to make uh, other outputs. So for example, fabrication output, you want the footprint position files. Generate footprint position file here. And this will generate a file, a comma separated value file of all the ICs and where their center points are. And this will help the pick and place machines at the uh, fab house, manufacturing house, to know where to put all the components. Another thing you should do back in the schematic over here is generate a bill of materials. So what components you actually want to be used for various capacitors, resistors, and so forth. I have a more detailed video going to, uh, well, more detail on how to actually do that and export these files properly. Uh, I'll link that in the description as well. But once you're done with that, and you're happy and exported all your files, one last thing I always do is do a Gerber viewer check just to make sure KiCad has exported the files properly. So I'll just load all those in. It'll import them, and I'll just go through every layer to see if all the copper fills are correct, if all the vias are in the correct place, the board outline seems okay, and just go through those individually and so forth. Okay, so once you're happy with that, uh, just send them off to your fab house, and then it's time to test the device when it arrives with you. So I hope this has just been helpful as an introduction to RF and kind of high-speed signaling layout. Uh, with USB and STM and NRF. And if you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments. Thanks a lot.